Hey guys, welcome to the rating climb video from 14 to 1600. This is right about the rating level where the game starts to get a little more difficult. So instead of playing and commentating at the same time, I've already played three games that I'm going to show you now. So I don't run out of time while I'm explaining stuff, but let's take a look. So the first game was black against the 1522 and he played knight f3. And I actually like to play knight c6 against knight f3 because a lot of times they'll just play g3, bishop g2 right away. And by playing knight c6, I'm threatening to play e5. And so if I'm able to, like for example, let's say they played g3, I could play e5, uh, d3, and I can get the strong center right away. And I am comfortable from playing from those positions. So that's why I like to start with knight c6. Um, but in this case, what happened in the game, he played d4, and so he, he took away that option, which is a good move. Um, but then I can go into, and this is what I played, d5, and this is um, what's called the Jigoran defense. I don't have a ton of experience with it, but I've played it I played it from time to time, and it can be a little tricky, and so I like some of the positions that we get into from here. So that's what I went for, and this is kind of the idea behind the Jigoran. You develop your queenside pieces rapidly, and a lot of times you can castle queenside and, you know, sometimes break open the center right away and it can get pretty tricky. So I played bishop g4 and he played e3, which is a pretty passive move, um, but it is one of the main lines. So that's fine. And I played e5. And the point here is I'm taking advantage of the fact that the knight is pinned. So if he takes back, I can recapture with the knight and I have this happening and also um, lets out the bishop and fights for d4 so it's it's a just a good solid move it does a lot of different things and so he did actually capture and initially like i said my plan was to recapture here with the knight but then he can actually just take on d5 i'm losing that pawn and even though i have this um attack twice he's, he's got to defend it he can just take back and it looked like that was going to be a pretty okay position for him and so i decided to take here on c4 and the idea being i'm threatening to trade his trade queens and if i capture then he's not going to be able to castle and, but if he takes me, well, then I can recapture with the rook, and it immediately puts my rook in a very active file. So I like that either way the queens might get traded, it would probably lead to my rook being on this open file. So that, well, that looks pretty strong, so that's why I went um, for this route. And he did capture it, and so then I took back with the rook, like I said, putting it on this open file. So he played bishop e2, and at this point, there's a couple things going through my mind. Number one is I could just do a you know random developing move, like maybe bring this bishop out with check. And then he'd probably play something like bishop d2, maybe takes, takes. It looks just like kind of normal, you know, fine for him. Nothing, nothing that he has to worry about. Um, so I was kind of scanning for any other options. And so I'm looking for weaknesses in his position. So when you look at this board, what do you see as a, as a potential weakness for white? Well, if you said this c2 square, you would be correct. And I actually have the ability to go to knight b4 and it's immediately threatening the fork. And the interesting thing about this move is that if he tries to do something logical like just castling, well, I can still play knight c2 and the rook is trapped. And so he's not able to do the logical move to escape. He has to come up with something else. So that's the move I went for because it looked like it created a pretty good threat. And additionally, I have uh, knight to d3. And so there's really two things that I'm thinking about and he can't stop both of them. And so now I'm thinking that I'd like to play knight d3, and one of the things that that does is it opens up this bishop. And if I'm able to trade this off, he's going to have some really bad pawns over here, double isolated uh, on the, the side. So that looks pretty good. The issue is he can take here first, and then if I like take back, he can move his knight away. And so I thought what I would do is trade here, and then if he takes with the, the bishop, my knight can go in, forcing his king to move so he can't castle. And then I could trade this off, mess up his pawn structure, and, and that looked like a pretty good plan. Uh, now the other option is he could take back with the pawn and then he still leaves his bishop here, but then he's got doubled pawns here, isolated pawn here. So basically I'm, I'm looking for ways to mess up his pawn structure um, since there's not really a way to like win a piece or, or you know do anything else really, really good. Uh, I'm looking for smaller victories that I can build on later as the game goes on. So I played captures first and then followed through with knight to d3. And so I'm threatening to trade here and and really mess up his pawn structure unless he takes my knight, which he did. But then I have this pawn, which is already has a rook behind it. It's a pass pawn. 
and it has the ability to potentially become a protected pass pawn. If I can get this guy up here um, at some point, right? A6, B5, you know, get this pawn here, I can have this pawn chain. And so you're gonna see as the game progressed, that's actually what happened. Um, and so that's kind of what I was going for. So now at this moment, I, like I said, I wanna be able to protect this pawn because a protected pass pawn is really good. And so C5, C4, look like two logical moves. The issue is if I play c5 now, he can play b3, and then I can't go there, he's just gonna take it, right? He's got two pieces. And so it's not that easy for me to, to get that move in. So what I decided to do was play bishop to b4 first, and the idea is that once this knight's gone, I can just play c5, c4, and even if he plays you know b3, I'm, I can still just do that and I have it covered. And so also I'm developing a piece, and you know pinning the knight and so it just seemed like a logical way to follow through and so he does chase the bishop away and i captured it and then followed through with my plan of setting up this pawn chain right and getting the protected pass pawn so we played rook to c1 and then i played c4 and com completed the pawn chain so then he played rook to g1 and he's obviously attacking this and usually one of the best ways to deal with a rook that's on a half open file is to push your pawn forward so that it's protected by your other pawns and it kind of makes the rook not as effective. Now in this position before I did that, I thought very carefully about what was gonna happen if he played bishop to c3 because that is potentially you know, a very dangerous move, right? Attacking my rook, all he has to do is move this forward and my rook is kind of stuck in the corner. So that was one thing that I did calculate out that yes, there was gonna be a way for me to save my rook if he did that and I thought that through before um, I played g6, otherwise I would have had to come up with some other options, which there really isn't a lot of good options, uh, even king f8, you know, bishop's gonna come in, um, and so that's not really a good move, but still, I wanted to think through that. So I played g6, he did go bishop c3, and then what I had thought through was knight e7, and the idea is if he pushes the pawn now and attacks the rook, um, I can just simply move it, right? I can just go here or here, and if he takes this, my king can just take, everything's fine. Now he didn't actually push it, he played king to d2, and so he's kind of got a little blockade here uh, on these pawns. So I played knight to d5, I'm just centralizing the knight, bringing it closer to, you know, towards the action, towards these pawns, and, and eventually maybe it can help support uh, pushing these forward. And he played here, and just attacking the pawn, so I just moved it forward. And then we have h4, king to e7. So I'm not worried about this, if he goes there and takes, I'll just take it back, if he goes here and here, doesn't really do anything, I'm not worried about that. It actually probably becomes um, a target and a weakness that maybe I can capture. And so wasn't worried about that. Bringing the king forward to activate the king and also trying to get this rook into the game. So we have f4, king e6, rook g3, and this was just a little tactic. So, so going back just a couple moves, um, as soon as he played f4, there's almost a little tactic here where I can capture, capture, and then I can take his bishop and win a pawn. The issue is it doesn't actually work because right now he can play bishop c5 check first, got to move my king, and then he takes my knight and actually lose a piece. So one of the things when I was playing king to e6, I was threatening that uh, knight sacrifice, and he actually didn't see that and played the rook g3 move, which allowed me to then follow up with uh, the little tactic. So that's what I did. It just wins a pawn um, and trades off the knight and bishop in the process, which is, I think was a good thing because this bishop's very centralized, um, you know, in, in a really good spot. And so trading that off helped me um, progress. And here my opponent actually resigned, so we didn't get a chance to finish out the game, but you can see because of the connected pass pawns, um, white's pieces are really tied up to, you know, prevent these from moving forward. And because of that, it frees up my king and my two rooks to kind of go and and hunt down some of these targets, right? And so that's probably what he was thinking and why he resigned. All right, the next two games, I was white and both of my opponents played the Karo Khan. So any Karo Khan defense players out there, you might wanna pay attention to these two games. Here we go, e4, c6, and I like to play this two knights attack line where you bring both knights out uh, instead of playing d4 right away. And I play that because there's a lot of little tricks, especially against um, lower rated, I mean, I played against higher rated players, but especially against lower rated players, there's lots of little tricks um, that they can fall for. And so I'll show you, you're gonna see some of those um, real soon. So uh, this is the first trick. Um, a lot of players like to bring the knight out and then defend it 
with their other knight. But if they do that in this position, it's a complete blunder and the game is over. We have a smothered checkmate. Um, so that's a cool one. And I don't actually mind if they capture and then move their knight here later and attack my queen. I just bring it over to the king side and use it to generate an attack if they ever castle kingside. So I'm comfortable playing those types of positions. So I really like this queenie to move uh, in this position when they when they bring the knight out. So that's what I did. And he actually played bishop to g4. Um, and then I can trade here. And you can see black's pawn structure is a little messed up. Now it's not terrible because black does have the bishop pair. Um, but, you know, it's, it's something. So h3 he decided to trade and then knight d7 and here d4 i'm just gaining control of the center taking away this square from the knight so i don't lose a tempo on my queen and letting out the bishop so i can develop and he played queen to b6 so lining up on the pawn and just c3 just a simple move you know defends it castled queen side and now i played g3 and so the reason i played g3 as opposed to like maybe bishop e2 or bishop d3 is I already know where his king's gonna be. And you know, putting my bishop here, yes, it's a good diagonal, but it's it's not attacking where his king's at. And I like to be aggressive and focus on, you know, where's his king gonna be at. And so g3, bishop g2, I'm creating this battery. And then moves like b4, a4, b5 become much stronger because at the end of you know some pawn trades, I potentially have a checkmate threat. And so this move was really kind of thinking ahead on, on setting up that battery right away. So that's what g3 was all about. He moved his king over. I played bishop d2, he moved his king over again. I'm not entirely sure um, what the idea was. I think that was probably a mistake, you know, because he's neglecting develop, developing. This bishop is still stuck. He could have been getting his rooks on maybe half open files you know, breaking open the center before I could get my king out of the way, things like that probably would have been a little better for, for black. But I went ahead and castled, and then we have e5. And now it actually drops a pawn, um, because if I capture, which I did, if he takes back with the knight, then this pawn's hanging, and he took back with the pawn, but then this pawn's hanging, so I went ahead and took it. And then we have bishop c5. Now one of the things when you grab free pawns like this that you have to be careful about is it creates half open files for your opponent. And so he could bring his work over here, tax my queen, and I have to be a little careful that there's some pressure happening on this square. And so I found a little tactic to deal with that. I figured he was gonna move his rook next move. So I played the move before, and I'm kind of setting a little trap here. If he goes for that, uh, which he did, then I can capture the bishop and even though I'm losing my queen, I'm getting, sorry, I'm getting his queen. And so I, at the end of the day, I won a piece basically uh, by that little trick. And so rook f8 was not really uh, a move that was possible. He would have had to just retreat the bishop somewhere. And then what I would have achieved is getting pressure off of that diagonal. I could then follow up with my bishop and then I'm in a really good, um, good spot, right? So that was the idea behind before. And then we had this. He decided to not trade the queen and just capture back. And so I just went ahead and took that other pawn. And like I said, you do have to be careful taking those pawns because you do create half open files. But in this case, I felt okay doing it because my bishop is doing a good job of defending that one. This is, you know, defended by this. Now it's, it is pinned. But um, I felt like my pieces were in a good, good position to defend if his rook did go over there. And so that's why I was comfortable going ahead and, and taking it. Okay, so he captured here, and then I played bishop g5. I had to uh, defend the rook, so I just moved that out of the way. And also at the same time, I have a little threat here. If he moves the rook, then the knight's gonna be hanging. And if he doesn't move the rook, well, then I'm just gonna take it with uh, my bishop. So he played um, rook over, trying to, you know, delay the, this idea. Um, so I just went back, and again, I'm still keeping the same threat. If he moves the rook, I take the knight. If he doesn't, I take the rook. Again, he did that. And same idea, queen g4, still keeping uh, the threats. And so at this point, I, I did consider taking the rook, letting him take my queen, and then recapturing. Um, two rooks for a queen is, is an okay trade, and I'm already up the piece. So at that point, I would have you know two rooks, two bishops against a queen and knight. Much better for me. 
Um, but it looked like I didn't need to trade. I could just bring this other rook into the game and I still have lots of threats, right? Now his knight's being attacked by my rook, but if he moves, then there's the pin from the rook here with the bishop. And so that just looked like a stronger move. That's why I didn't go for the trade. I just went for this. He played a5 and then I just took the knight. And one thing that I did see at the end of all these trades, I saw this before, uh, that's why I went for this, is that there was gonna be this fork. And so he, he actually loses the rook if he takes the bishop. Um, and so we have this. And then it's just a matter of, you know, I traded off the queen and, um, you know, get a queen came over here. All right, so game number three, I was white. And like I said, it was another Karo Khan. So I played the two knights attack again. And he played the bishop f5 line this time instead of last game we saw was the knight of six line uh, against bishop f5 i play knight to g3 and when they go back i play h4 and one thing that's different about the two knights attack than the normal mainline carol khan is normally white has these two pawns forward instead of an extra knight here and so let me just show you what i mean if we go back the main line would be i play d4 and then if d5 um, knight c3 takes takes and now when they play bishop f5, if I go knight g3, they go back, I could play here. If they play this, this is the position, okay? I have no knight to e5 move because my knight's still here. But if you go back to what happened in the game, you're gonna see the difference. We have the exact same position, except now instead of d4, I have not my knight on f3, which gives me the ability to play knight to e5. And this is a really annoying move for uh, black and I, th I think this is just winning for white, actually. Like, there's nothing that Black can do um, to deal with this in a good way. Like, yes, he can defend it, and this is what he did in the game, queen to d6. Uh, but it's really not a great position uh, for Black to be in. And I'll show you what a lot of people do, and this is a trap, very, very common trap. A lot of people will play h6 when you play h4. And then you can play knight to e5, and a lot of people will go back to h7. And it looks like, okay, they've save their bishop everything is good but actually that's not the case you play queen h5 threatening checkmate you play g6 to block it there's really not very many other moves that are good you can come back to f3 attacking it again and when they block with the knight you can play queen to b3 and you've got attack here attack here they can't defend them both and it's uh yeah it's just a really good position uh for white so that's a little trap that i like to play but let's go back to the game so h4, he played h5, and then knight e5, queen d6, and then I just played d4. Uh, I didn't want to defend my knight, and so d4 is a good move, and it also lets out the bishop. And then he played knight to f6, which was a little mistake, because now the bishop's no longer defended by the queen. And that's a big deal, because I can take it, and he's got a serious weakness here, right? The h-pawn has moved forward, now the f-pawn's gone, and so this is a big target. And so naturally, bishop d3 was... The move to play just to, to pile up on that and i also have the added benefit he can't just move it um and so we have knight here i took it and then king d8 so at this point i'm thinking all right i want to get my bishop out uh, but where do i develop it to well this looks like a really nice diagonal but i can't go there because his queen would just uh, take me and so maybe bishop b3 would be okay or bishop g5 but then i was like what if i move my queen so that I could play my bishop there and gain control of this diagonal. And it's an interesting move because it does give up this pawn on d4 for free if he wants to take it. But this is what I was thinking. Um, if he takes it, I would play bishop e3 at that point, which gains a tempo on the queen and also gives up this pawn. But then I could castle, and what I've done is sacrifice two pawns there, but I have all my pieces out. I'm castled, so my king is safe. And I have both rooks ready to go start attacking things, right? And so a lot of times what you'll find is that is really, really good compensation for two pawns. In fact, and you can look at the engine over here, says I'm just winning by like four points. Um, it's just really, really good. And so a lot of times these turned out these turn out to be poisoned pawns, and they're basically they're free pawns, but they're you don't want to take them. So that's what I was, you know, thinking. And so that's why I played queen f3 to kind of set that up if he wanted to, to take it. He didn't go for that. He played um, knight here, which is attacking my bishop. And so I captured the pawn. Uh, it's defended well. And so I just went ahead and took it. And then we have g6. 
we had to retreat the bishop, bishop g7, and c3. So then he played rook f8, uh, he's attacking the queen, and so I just played back to e2. Um, I'm keeping control of these files, you know, defending here, keeping the bishop uh, protected. That seemed like a, a, the best place for the queen to go. And then king c7, and now I have a little test for you. What is the best move for white and why? There's actually a really, really strong move, and I played it in the game, but I didn't even realize how strong it was until after the fact. But go ahead and see if you can find it. What does white play here? Well, if you said knight to e4, you are correct. And so I played that move in the game, and what I was thinking was uh, I'm going to attack his queen. After he moves the queen, I'm going to play knight to g5 with the idea that I'm going to come in here with a with a fork. And so that's literally all I thought about. And then after I played it, I started to think, okay, he's probably going to move his queen to... Wait, where's he going to move his queen to? And I looked further and realized the queen is actually trapped. Um, there's no spaces for the queen to go here. Can't go here. This is covered by the bishop, pawn, rook. Uh, this is covered by this bishop, and this is covered by this knight. So really weird position, um, but the queen is trapped. And so knight e4 just actually wins the queen, and he resigned at this point when he realized that. So there you go. Those are the three games in the 14 to 1600 rating range. Um, I hope you learned something. As always, leave questions, comments below, and um, We'll see you in the 16 to 1800 video coming out next. But as always, thanks for watching. Stay sharp, play smart, and take care.